I'm Chiquita Banana, and I've come to say bananas have to ripen in a certain way, and when they're flecked with brown and have a golden hue, bananas taste the best and are the best for you. You're listening to one of the most famous commercial jingles of all time, performed by singer Patty Clayton in 1944. Patty gave her voice to the animated Miss Chiquita Banana, a cartoon in a red dress who balanced a bowl of fruit on her head while dancing the salsa. At its peak, the Chiquita Banana jingle was played up to 346 times a day on radio stations across America, making Miss Chiquita a household name long before she danced into living rooms on televisions in the 1950s. In the coming decades, she would help to make bananas the most popular fruit in the United States. But what Americans didn't know about the fruit, what the iconic blue sticker, was the upheaval it left in its wake. Chiquita's original name was United Fruits, before rebranding and was an extremely powerful business in South America. So powerful that it had great influence over the local government. For the first half of the 20th century, Chiquita poured investment capital into Guatemala, buying the country's productive land and controlling shares in its railroads, electric utilities, and telegraph industries. As a result, the Guatemalan government was subservient to Chiquita's interests, exempting the company from internal taxation and guaranteeing workers earn no more than 50 cents per day. At the time of the 1944 Guatemalan Revolution, Chiquita was the country's number one landowner, employer, and exporter. Peter Chapman writes in Bananas, his insightful history of the company, more powerful than nation states, a law unto itself, and accustomed to regarding the republic as its own private freedom. United Fruits essentially invented not only the concept and reality of the banana republic, but also, as Chapman shows, the concept and reality of the modern banana. If it weren't for United Fruit, he observes, the banana would never have emerged from the dark then arrived in such quantities as to bring prices that made it available to all today. But when Brooklyn-born Keith planted a few banana cuttings next to a railroad track in Costa Rica in the early 1870s, it was virtually unknown outside of its native environment. Keith and his partners soon realized how great the potential profits were, especially if along with growing bananas, they could control railroads, shipping, and Central American governments. And to that end, Keith ended up marrying the beautiful daughter of Costa Rican president. Only then did they set out to turn the banana into a product for the masses. Until its demise, a hundred years later, United Fruit controlled as much as 90% of the market. Still, that is not to say there are no echoes of United Fruit today. Chapman could have noted, for example, that the company's successor in the banana business, Chiquita Brands International, has admitted to paying nearly two million to right-wing debt squads in Colombia, and the blowback from United Fruit's way of doing business still haunts Latin America. Guatemala was once one of United Fruit's most treasured possessions, but now is in a state of instability and mass poverty. Guatemala was chosen as the site for the company's earliest development activities, a former United Fruit executive once explained. Because at the time we entered Central America, Guatemala's government was the weakest, most corrupt, and most pliable. In 1950, when a left-wing Democratic president, Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, was elected with 65% of the vote, and Chiquita perceived his agricultural land reforms as a threat to their corporate interest. Chiquita, with the help of the father of the modern public relations, Edward L. Bernays, waged a propaganda war and managed to convince the American public and politicians that the president was secretly a dangerous communist who could not be allowed to remain in power. With McCarthy-era hysteria in full swing, President Eisenhower secretly ordered the CIA to overthrow the democratically elected president in a 1954 covert operation. The CIA armed and trained an ad hoc liberation army under the command of exiled Guatemalan army officer and used them in conjunction with the diplomatic, economic, and propaganda campaign. At the time, the American public was told that Guatemala was undergoing a revolution. The CIA's involvement was long suspected 
and fully revealed when the agency released thousands of documents in 1997. During this time, a young Argentinian traveler named Che Guevara happened to be in Guatemala when the overthrow was going on. After that, Che told his mother, I left the path of reason, and so too did Latin America that day marked a turning point, the end of a hopeful age of reform and the beginning of a bloody age of revolution and reaction. Over the next four decades, hundreds of thousands of people, 200,000 in Guatemala alone, were killed in guerrilla attacks, government crackdowns, and civil wars across Latin America. Chiquita Banana still has a hold on Latin America to this day. And when the Honduran military deposed President Manuel Zelia on June 28, 2009, many took it as an unfriendly reminder of the Banana Republic era. Chiquita remains a major presence in Honduras. And at the time, some questioned whether the fruit company played a role in backing the 2009 coup, as it did in 1954 in neighboring Guatemala. As the coup crisis progressed, though, Chiquita's name was hardly mentioned. Elite business interests, including Chiquita as well as the Honduras manufacturing sector, were distributed by Zella, raising the minimum wage by 60%. So nobody was surprised that the country's business council CEAL, the Honduras equivalent to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, wanted to spin the coup as constitutional and to paint Zella as a Hugo Chavez aligned would be dictator. With American news media focusing attentions elsewhere, perhaps Chiquita no longer felt it necessary to maintain the appearance of separation from the coup supporters. The coup regime and its backers had successfully spun America into believing the coup was a constitutional response to an illegal power grab by a pro-Chavez president. Most who were following the story, including policymakers, had accepted Zella's removal as illegal, and the Banana Republic allegations had faded from the limelight. However, with increasing political violence, oppression, and human rights violations at the hands of the post-coup government, and Chiquita's apparent connection to the coup supporters, Perhaps Honduras really has become a banana republic once again.